So welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, I am Dr. Marco Lucchetti, and I am the European Clinical Manager at GL Care. And today I have the honor and the pleasure to host this uh, second uh, Meet the Expert session uh, at Euro Anesthesia 2020, sponsored by GL Care. Uh, a crucial part of perioperative care is the prevention of anesthesia and surgery related complications uh, that may compromise patient outcomes, uh, leading to prolonged recovery times and higher costs. Monitoring relevant parameters before, during, and after surgery and delivering a personalized anesthetic strategy may help clinicians to uh, improve postoperative patient's outcome, reducing thus the incidence of complications. Uh, I would like to remind uh, you that this session will be recorded. Uh, and also I want to give you some information about practicalities. We will have time in the end for a, a discussion. So we will have question and answers. And please preferably uh, raise your hand by using uh, the button that you see uh, in the bottom of the chart and you will be uh, unmuted and allowed to speak up and ask your questions. Uh, otherwise, if you prefer alternatively, you can write your question down uh, in the chat window. But, but hopefully we, we, we would like to, this to be interactive and maybe it's better if you, if you just speak up and ask your question directly. Um, I would say now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, outstanding expert today. Uh, Kai Zakharovsky is professor and chair of the Department of Anesthesia, Intensive Care and Pain Therapy at Goethe University Hospital in Frankfurt, Germany. He is a leading expert in transfusion and clotting, uh, innate immunity, uh, cardiovascular uh, and critical care medicine. And he currently uh, serves, as you uh, probably know, as the president of the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. So he is actually uh, our host today. Uh, Professor Zakharovsky will speak about reducing postoperative complications by applying optimal intraoperative anesthesia management. Uh, so thank you, Professor Zakharovsky, and, and the, the, the floor is yours. Over to you. Yes. Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Marco, for the introduction and uh, welcome to Euro Anesthesia. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, what you see in the background is the Frankfurt skyline and this is our helicopter pass and it's really outstanding view. Um, but the photographer has cheated a little bit. He pushed um, the buildings a little bit together. However, it's still breathtaking. So, oops, sir. I would like to start with my presentation with the problem. The patient, whoever it is, goes to the hospital and expecting treatment. And the treatment is being done by the doctor. It's an interaction and hopefully uh, the patient gets better. And I'll try to summarize it on the right side. If you see outcome and what you have to invest. So, let, let me go through with you together what it means. So if you would like to have a very good surgical um, outcome result, obviously you need to have good training of the anesthesiologist and the surgeon. If you want to have less infection, you need to have a good hygiene concept. If you want to have less transfusion, you need patient blood management. If you want less delirium, you need MIHA. And you see at the bottom of the left side, MIHA maintain intraoperative hemodynamic stability. If you want um, the hospital length of stay being reduced, obviously you need to invest all of these. If you wanna have as an outcome less cost, you have to invest some sort of money. Morbidity, deaths, back to work. You probably have to do all of this again. And kidney injury, which is quite common after surgery. Again, you need MIHA maintain interoperative hemodynamic stability. I would like now to um, 
give you an example about problems in medicine. And the Bill Gates Foundation, they were looking for the leading global health problems. And surprisingly, in the year 2015, every fourth um, or the, the fourth highest uh, problem for humankind is anemia. And if you take all anemia forms together, so iron deficiency anemia and all other causes, then it's the leading cause of a health problem for humankind. So keep this in your mind. And I would like to reverse this back to you now. And with a little example, it's not so long ago, the, uh, the palace was saying that Prince Philip to have planned surgery. And my question to you is, you know, Prince Philip is in his late 90s. How full is his glass? Meaning, how full is his bloodstream? How much hemoglobin has he got? Is the glass full? Is it half full? Or is it half empty? And why I'm saying this is because this is represented by the hemoglobin or anemia. And you see, if this huge study was 227,000 patients, if the patients undergoing elective surgery and they had no anemia, the 30-day mortality rate was less than 1%. However, if they had only mild anemia, hemoglobin between 9 and 12, mortality increased by a factor of 5. And if they started the race with a hemoglobin less than 9, the, uh, the risk to die within 30 days was raised by 13. So that means a proper preparation changes the outcome of our patients. And to summarize, preoperative anemia is associated with 20% increase in length of stay, a twofold increase in infection rate, four times increase in kidney um, injury, three times higher mortality, and a five times increased risk of transfusion. So having this in mind, which other scenarios are so important and we hardly talk about it? And I feel honored that um, I can really talk about my vision. So you see on the left side, a man and woman undergoing surgery. And for that, they need anesthesia. And you're all aware of the monitoring. So if you have non-invasive blood pressure monitoring and heart rate, usually common is every five minutes, uh, the machine does a measurement. You also could put it to two and a half minutes or to 30 seconds. And what does it mean? If you look to the right side, you see the, the blood pressure in millimeters of mercury, and at the X axis, you see the time. So if you measure the blood pressure every five minutes, you might not be able to see that there was a, del uh, a prolonged phase of hypertension. If you do every two and a half uh, minutes, you have a higher chance uh, to see a, a blood pressure drop. But if you do it every 30, uh, 60 seconds, then you can really reduce the time. And why is this drop in blood pressure so important? It is important because if it's taking longer, we know it's associated with a worse outcome. So hemodynamic stability perioperatively is a highly important subject. Is it now very complex or is it more simple? And I would like to break it down to two important things. What you see is uh, the green, the green uh, cartoon here, oxygen delivery, and on the left side, perfusion pressure. So oxygen delivery obviously is dependent on arterial oxygen content, and so you need to have enough hemoglobin, and so on and so on. And on the other side, the perfusion pressure is dependent on cardiac output, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these two, I would say, is in principle quite basic. But very often we are not monitoring this enough. And I would like to introduce you to this very nice paper being published this year in the British Journal of Anesthesia around Bernd uh, Saugel from Hamburg. And um, it is a, random, a randomized clinical trial 
and um, it was all about personalized hemodynamic management. And they were looking basically as a personal cardiac index at rest and their treatments were fluids and an inotrop stopbutamine. And the end point of the study was, is there less complications or deaths within 30 days after surgery? And the control group was a routine management. And I would like to guide you through now the study. It was a single center randomized clinical trial and uh, 188 patients underwent randomization and there were uh, 94 assigned to the intervention group and 94 to the control group. The uh, primary outcome was a composite of major complications. And these complications were defined according the European Perioperative Clinical Outcome Definitions and from ESAIC, so the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care, and ESICAN, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. And the whole um, time frame was 30 days after surgery. And now the very interesting thing um, in, in this was, as you can see, that a day before surgery, the patients in the uh, treatment group, they had um, their personal resting cardiac in index evaluated with non-invasive pulse contour analysis and underwent a special treatment uh, tree. I'm going to show you this in increased size. They all received a baseline rate of six mil per kick per hour of a crystalloid. And the mean arterial pressure was supposed to be uh, between 65 and 90 millimeters of mercury using no epinephrine. Um, and if you look now at this decision tree, you see here, um, there's several treatments and yes and no. And um, they received the fluid bolus and dobutamine to reach the goal. And if the goal has not been achieved, it went back to the cycle and the whole thing again. And the, I think most interesting result was that in that the cardiac index, so the baseline cardiac index, varied considerably amongst the individuals. And in the personalized management group, it was 1.9 to 5.2 liters per minute per square meters. And then the routine or control group, it was 1.9 to 4.9. And the results um, were extremely interesting. So if you look at the use of vasopressors and inotropes, you see in the personalized group, 93, and in the routine group, 93 as well. If you look at the fluids, then it becomes really interesting because if you look at crystalloids 2730 versus 3000 colloids 1000 versus 1000 and crystalloids plus colloids 3110 versus three and a half liters but if you look at total fluids the personalized group had half a liter 500 ml less so it's really really interesting uh, data and if you look at the use of inotropes so to butamine during surgery, you see um, an increased use of this in the personalized group, 36, and here 10. So what does it mean now in terms of overall um, achievement of the outcome? So um, reaching the composite um, endpoint of positive complications and mortality at day 30 after surgery. And here are the data. You see in the personalized group, only 30% achieved this endpoint, this negative endpoint, this bad outcome, but 55% in the routine group. That's a huge difference. It's almost double. And obviously it was highly significant. You see the p-value was uh, 0.001. Um, so the authors concluded that in high-risk patients undergoing major abdominal surgery, that a personalized hemodynamic management, 
So with the decision tree, I've showed you using uh, different fluids, uh, crystalloids, colloids, but also dobutamine reduces significantly the outcome. So what a story. So it tells you definitely there is an advantage. And what I really like uh, in this study and the concept is the five T's. The five T's of perioperative goal-directed hemodynamic therapy. And the first one is target population. So you need to look for high-risk patients. They have really a benefit from a proper um, monitoring and preparation. Then timing of the intervention. So if you start early preparing your patients, they will have a better outcome. But also the type of intervention. So you combine fluids, vasopressors, and inotropes. And then obviously the target variable, so target blood flow variables, and the value, a personalized target values. So do not forget the five Ps. And you can see here um, this combined. And I, I really like the second part. If you look here, preoperative, interoperative, and postoperative. If you only do a very good job postoperatively, um, you, you will have in a group of patients a worse outcome. But if you start already preoperative with a proper preparation of the patient and identifying the right patient, then overall you will have an improved outcome after surgery. And that's what we want. And you see it down at the bottom here, the different ways what you can use like stroke volume, stroke volume index or cardiac output and cardiac index. And um, finally, um, I would like to summarize that it's like everything in medicine. If you have the chance and if you take the time and you prepare your patients before surgery when they're at risk, and especially hemodynamic stability is one of the extremely important things, then you can tell your patients that they will have in comparison a better outcome. And I don't know what happened now. Okay, and this is my last slide. And I have chosen this slide for two reasons. Um, I would start, I started my, my talk with uh, patient blood management and anemia. And um, in 2014, we founded uh, the German PBM network. In 2016, the European network. In 2017, the global PBM network. And you see, we have been awarded with the humanitarian award together with President Barack Obama and the new incoming president, Joe Biden. And it took several years to make people aware of how important it is to implement PBM. And I would say, no, we are now at the right time that we need a hemodynamic network. We need to make people aware of anesthesiologists, but also surgeons. That's a huge benefit if before surgery, patients will be prepared in a proper way. So thank you very much for your attention. And now I think we're open questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kai, for your uh, insights on the importance of uh, hemodynamic management and for highlighting the importance of the continuum of care across the whole periop period. I think this is very important. Uh, congratulations for what you do with the, the, the patient blood management network and hopefully this will be extended to uh, the whole hemodynamic management. So now for the time we have remaining approximately 10 minutes we, we, can, uh, we can answer your, uh, Professor Zakharovsky can answer your questions. So. I, I want to remind you, if you want to ask questions, please use the button, raise hand. You can find it in the uh, lower part, in the bottom part, left corner, in the, in the participant window, chat window. Uh, or otherwise, you can just write your question in the chat window. Any question from the audience? 
maybe I can start uh, to 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 break the ice with with just question from from my side. Uh, so imagine you are a, a patient or or one of your family member is a patient that needs surgery. Uh, what would you like to have in the hospital prior surgery, in terms yes. of of course, in terms of uh, uh, assessment? Yes. Um, it's probably more than what I like. I would say it's mandatory and it needs to come from both sides, from the anesthesiologist, but also from the surgeon. So there needs to be a mutual agreement between both parties that to achieve the best outcome for our patients, that preparation prior an elective surgery is the best thing you can do. And that means um, because we have so many patients at risk and they are high risk patients that an investment of a proper hemodynamic um, measurement before surgery is the absolutely mandatory approach we should use nowadays. But having said this, we are far away from this. And that's the reason why I'm so happy that you are stressing this out that we have to work on this issue because we can change uh, the outcome of our patients. So family members, I would say uh, it's a great wish and I would definitely would force it that they will be assessed before surgery and especially before elective surgery. Yeah, and, and uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. So maybe on, on the same topic, we, we can just a little step farther because we know and we agree that uh, uh, there is uh, very likely that there is a, a benefit in terms of outcome if you do a, a proper periop evaluation and assessment and preparation of the patient. Uh, do you think this is also uh, able to uh, reduce the costs in hospital? Because you know that this is, uh, this is a major problem today with, with, with uh, financial constraints in many, in many countries. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, it's, the problem is you always have to start doing something is number one. So you have to convince uh, parties involved in treating patients. Number two, you have to invest time and some money. But the money you save later on it's far more. And that's a long process to convince people. And, and it needs to come from, in my personal opinion, from um, health insurance partners. And we, that's the reason why I had this comparison with patient blood management, because it took us 10 years to convince the health insurance companies to, uh, to accept that money can be saved and have a better outcome at the same time. And I'm 100% sure we can go the same direction with the um, hemodynamic assessment prior elective surgery. But it's a process. And I think it's the right time to start this now. Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's just convincing the administrators that uh, investing in these will bring uh, a benefit maybe in, uh, in five years, in 10 years. Yes, absolutely. But maybe this goes now um, faster um, because um, it, we have so many examples in medicine where um, interventions um, being questioned and it takes a long time before it's basically a normal medicine. And at the moment, we all think, oh, the patient in theater and then we do our normal job and we're doing a good job. Yes, we're probably be doing a good job, but we have really forgotten the preparation and of the patient and not every patient is the same. And I call it indiv individualized uh, medicine. So some patients have a higher blood pressure, some have a lower one, and you cannot uh, treat everybody the same. And that is the reason why we have to invest the time and money in this direction. So I received here a question from- uh, Yes. Biomarkers and- the risk Exactly, of yes. Yeah. Um, it's, that's a good question. I mean, um, 
biomarkers. Um, I'm not sure what uh, the, the colleague is uh, meaning that which particular biomarkers, but um, obviously um, you use laboratory um, biomarkers in terms of uh, for the risk assessment, but independent of that, it's still, we do not know how people or patients react during uh, anesthesia. Some have a huge drop in blood pressure, some they don't. So I think we need to, to have further studies to really uh, associate biomarkers, the risk assessment, and later on the outcome, depending on um, hemodynamics um, pre, during, and after surgery. So thank you for interesting uh, for this interesting question. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Pekrul, if, if you I don't know if if you want to comment further, you can. Uh, if you want to raise your hand, we we can unmute you and you can speak up. Let us know. I think we have uh, a couple more minutes to go, so maybe. I will ask one more question. Uh, what, to, to your knowledge, uh, Kai, what, what is the, the rate of adoption of uh, uh, goal-directed hemodynamic uh, therapy today in clinical practice? Yeah. Um, is, is it widespread? Is it not? Yeah, uh, it's not, it, it is not widespread. Definitely not. And... Um, I'm always thinking about, um, you know, when there was this old trial, sepsis trial, if you do an early goal-directed therapy and it was central venous pressure driven, some others, um, it was a fantastic idea because it was, it was um, a standardized procedure. And if you get people into um, doing it, really doing it, then you will see an improvement, but we are far away from this. The variables and variability is so high that we are just at the beginning. And I think it's on one side, it's sad, but on the other side, we have identified the problem and we have to work on it now. We have to educate and we have to do further studies and really showing how important it is. So um, yes, it is at the end of the day, we are at the start point and the variability is extremely high. Good. And maybe just one, I don't see other question in the chat. So just one quick question and a quick answer from you. Uh, we, we have seen that in, in, in that study, uh, very recent one, uh, they, they use uh, uh, cardiac index and cardiac output. Uh, but what about common clinical practice? If cardiac output is not available or indicated, uh, is, is uh, non-invasive blood pressure enough to use during anesthesia and surgery? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, you asked me at the beginning um, about investment and I think it's only blood pressure in my eyes is probably not enough. And, um, and we, have to, we have to take the investment, but to do the investment, we have to convince the, the money giver, uh, like health insurance companies and the hospital, that it is, has really an advantage, has really a benefit for outcome. And that is the difficult thing. So, uh, coming back to patient blood management, it was exactly the same problem. We have to calculate the benefits. We had to really provide numbers, euro or, what, what you, or US dollars. And that is later on the key for better uh, patient care. So just blood pressure is not enough. Definitely not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zakharovsky. It was very interesting. Uh, our time together, unfortunately, has come to an end. Uh, so again, thank you for your time. Uh, and on behalf of GL Care, I want to thank you all the, the colleagues that were joining us today. Thank you for your time, for your attention. Uh, and even more importantly, thank you for what you are doing uh, to, to care for anesthesia patients in, in these tough times. Stay well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you again. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Marco, and for organizing the session. Brilliant. And I hope thank everybody you. enjoyed it. And stay safe and healthy as well from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone.